Well, I want to make a definite um, something we've heard off and on uh, during the morning, which is there's a recurring phenomenon of uh, f federal funding of elite science which ends up uh, producing a mass market. And I've been fortunate enough to live through uh, four of those to help midwife them. I have to be careful in this town how you say these things. Um, and I'll go through those very quickly, but here's an example of automobile adoption. And you'll notice it goes from 1900 to 1940, many decades to get up to where most people had cars. Um, and so my view metaphorically is that this is where NSF invests. At the very early time when it's technologically possible but yet very far from a mass market. A good example of this was in 1985 when the NSF uh, created uh, the Supercomputer Center program. It, it had, of course, the supercomputer centers, but then it also linked them together with what became the NSF net backbone at 56 kilobits, the same as a dial-up modem. However, that was a super network because at that time, the modems that you had on your PC were 1,200 baud, so this is 50 times the bandwidth of what you were trying to connect to. And that notion of balance of, of super networks and supercomputers has continued all the way up till today. The NSF net was commercialized in 1995, leading directly to the um, internet that we know. This is a data-driven visualization by Donna Cox, Bob Patterson at uh, one of the NSF supercomputer centers. Uh, and that shows the connectivity and traffic when the backbone was up to 45 megabits a second, which you may note is a thousand times greater from when it was a decade before. And so the, we forget sometimes the exponential occurs in both the supercomputers and the, and, and the networks. Now, here I am uh, with one of my baby pictures. Um, this is my first YMP uh, supercomputer. I was pretty excited. It was the first gigaflops uh, machine we had. It cost about $15 million. And the NSF at that point um, was uh, running a megabit a backbone. This is 1990. Well, here 15 years later, your PCs that you're using around here are quite a bit more powerful than that YMP. And they are, uh, you, you take it for granted that you've got the same bandwidth at home, a few megabits per second, as the big pipe that connected the supercomputer centers, the national backbone in just 1990. And so again, you can see NSF's early uh, investment uh, dramatically transforming our entire society, our entire economy, and uh, continuing to keep the United States in world leadership. Well, it's, it's, it's going on beyond that. In just a couple of years, we're going to have uh, the Blue Waters uh, Petascale machine. A Petascale is a million gigaflops. In other words, it's a million times faster than that Cray that I'm sitting on. Um, and it's possible because that Cray only had four processors, and those four processors were handmade, very one-of-a-kind processors, only a few hundred are ever sold, whereas this will have 200,000 cores uh, from IBM, their Power 7, and, and, and uh, coming from a very broadly based uh, uh, commercial environment. Um, an unexpected benefit of having invested in the supercomputer centers besides the NSF net, which took off on its own, uh, when we started, there was an office of advanced scientific computing, and there was just a person in that office that happened to deal with the network. I mean, it, that's, I almost think the internet is uh, an unexpected consequence. And by the way, Dennis Jennings, who was that person, allowed NSF to make a, a rule that if you wanted networking, if you wanted money in your grant, for networking, it had to be TCPIP. And I view that as a pretty interesting federal intervention in the marketplace because at that point, DECnet was what all the physicists had, and that's what they wanted in their grants. And they said, nope, it's got to be TCPIP. And that standardization is one of the main things that made the internet grow ubiquitously. Well, uh, as you know, Tim Berners Lee at CERN, a particle accelerator, decided he wanted to find a way to put physics preprints up so he could read them, uh, developed the web protocols, and uh, just a couple of years later at NCSA, we were building a synchronous collaboration environment called NCSA Collage, 
and we needed to add into that uh, documents. And so uh, we made Mosaic, uh, Andreessen and Eric Bina um, did that as an undergraduate and graduate student team. We were funding about 75 students at that time, that was, were two of them. Um, uh, Mark went out with his team and Jim Clark to form Netscape. Uh, we licensed uh, yet to 100 commercial licensees, one of which was Microsoft, uh, which made Internet Explorer, if you look in the About box. Uh, the source code, which was being used, this was being downloaded freely to everyone around the world, uh, went by open source to Apache, which is then the server used pretty much uh, around the world now. Uh, again, all this was coming from a, a few students that were funded at the Supercomputer Center. This is Stefan Fengemeyer, who is now a director, but in just a few years ago he was one of the leading wizards at Industrial Light and Magic. And what you can see over there uh, is the thunderstorm in 1987 that was the visualization of the results of a supercomputer simulation of how just solving the laws of physics on a warm day out in the plains, this coherent self-excited entity called a thunderstorm emerges out of that uh, and so we needed to figure out how could we see what was coming out of all these numbers and and he developed that well he then went to industry taking that idea of scientific visualization which we had several NSF reports on and was there to do the middleman and and uh, Terminator uh, and then uh, headed up a lot of the special effects in Jurassic Park Twister perfect storm and so forth so again a lot of these ideas came from the NSF uh, into the economy. And to show you what a difference uh, uh, 20 years can make, here's the same supercomputer, same scientist, Bob Wilhelmson, doing the supercomputer simulation. And in 2005, this is high definition output, and you can see the, the unbelievable detail of a tornado being generated out of that thunderstorm. Uh, and this is what that factor of a million fold has done for us. It's allowed us as scientists to be able to model the world as it really is in enough detail with enough uh, simulations that we can begin to actually, in this case, do faster than real time predictions of uh, severe, storms, severe storms and hopefully uh, save lives and property. Well, I don't want to get into a lot of detail of where we are now that we have the TerraGrid at NSF the petascale coming, but these are just a few examples of the level of detail and real world application that our academics are engaged in. Designing, you may see that little uh, radical up there in, um, uh, I don't know if I can point with this thing or not, but anyway, this is in uh, designing a bird flu drug or looking at the proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's plaque formation or in doing material science to improve hydrogen storage for fuel cells. These are just a few of the TerraGrid um, successes in the last year. And of course, it's not just NSF. The Department of Energy has worked back and forth. They, you know, we, when I wrote the proposal in 83 for what became NCSA, I unabashedly said I was borrowing everything I'd learned living at Livermore in the summer as a summer physicist about how you organize a large-scale uh, center like that. And, and the DOE, they have a, Office of Science has a new uh, uh, book out on its breakthroughs in fusion, supernovas, flames, Parkinson's disease. And th the point is this is all across the board, and it's not just toys anymore. These, these, we've reached the scale with the Pettus scale machines that we will be able to uh, interact very closely between simulations in the real world. But the flip side of this is, if you can do a petascale, so I remind you that that's a million, billion, 13 digit multiplies a second. <laughs> that generates a fair amount of data. You can't just print it out on green paper anymore uh, from, a, from a printer. So how do we handle these vast flows of data? And of course, it's not just the supercomputers. It's all of our gene sequencers and DNA arrays and mass specs and microscopes and telescopes and so forth. And so there's just this unbelievable generation of data. Well, we talk a lot about broadband. There's a broadband initiative in this country now being talked about. But here in just one day is the difference in broadband that I experience. If I'm on my cell phone or using a cell card in my PC, I'm a few hundred kilobits. If I'm at home, it's a few megabits. If I'm on a university dorm, 
it's up to maybe 100 megabits. If I'm at Cal IT2 or other places that are connected to these dedicated 10 gigabit fibers, then it's 10,000 megabits. That's a 100,000 fold difference in my bandwidth, even though I call it broadband. So the word broadband is a little bit uh, ill-defined. As Bill Gibson says, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. But it starts first in the universities, and um, here's a map of the uh, fiber that's been uh, released from the private sector uh, by the um, National Lambda Rail. Uh, the Internet 2 now has its dynamic circuits working in the same way, and these are hooking up over two dozen uh, optical networks. These are dark fiber networks. This is in addition to the shared Internet. Uh, that allow for up to 40 of these 10,000 megabit clear channels. So th if you think about the Internet 2, it's connecting 200 universities, research universities, and all those students and faculty on them. That's a gazillion people. And the backbone for that is t 10 gigabits. Now what I'm saying is let's take that 10,000 megabit and give it to you as an individual for data intensive science. And that's what's actually going on. But if you all of a sudden are now getting 10,000 megabits a second into your lab instead of, say, 10 megabits, which is what you might get over the shared internet, like, what are you going to do? It's like, you know, drinking from a fire hose. And so we've developed through the NSF-funded Optiputer project using, again, as we heard this morning, uh, commercial uh, technology, just regular PCs and, and, and LCDs, the OptiPortal, which is the, your window into cyberspace, to handle this kind of data intensive. And you can see here it's connecting, being able to do simultaneously high definition and large cancer cells um, and so forth. And this is, again, two decades of, of NSF and DOE investment from our first power wall, which was four uh, projection uh, video projectors through the um, program for accelerated strategic computing at, at DOE uh, until then with the Optiputer first at University of Illinois Chicago and then NCSA and now at the Texas uh, uh, TerraGrid, uh, these very large walls have been created. Here is, for instance, Mike Norman, um, uh, uh, who is looking at these unbelievable models of the whole cosmos that he's done, you know, 10 billion light years on a side, and he's now connecting this to the petascale machines uh, in TerraGrid and in DOE. So I'll just end with this. What, where we're going is this what I call an opti platform. Um, it's, it's, it's a, if you'd like, an optical overlay to the normal shared internet, which is fine for email and, and web browsing and goes to billions of people, that's great. But for the few of us who do data intensive science, few compared to billions, uh, this is uh, how it's going to do it. You're, you're, you have to have these OptiPortals in your, in, your, in your lab, you have campus switches, and all of our campuses have to learn how to build this new kind of infrastructure, uh, linking into data repositories, a lot of telepresence, the ability to collaborate with high definition or digital cinema. We're doing uh, the first experiments in that, and then of course connecting to all the scientific instruments and to the supercomputers. But again, over these dedicated 10 gigabit which themselves will go to 40 gigabit and 100 gigabit over just the next few years, um, while the internet itself, the broad universal internet, continues its growth. And, and I think that this is an opportunity, particularly right now, with the uh, funding going into broadband, to get the United States to take a, a, a step function, really, to get back into the leadership position, much as we did in 1985 with the establishment of the internet the NSF net backbone. So um, I'll stop there.